King. So glad you're all here this evening. Glad you could join us here on Facebook, uh, live or recorded. Um, uh, I don't know. Let's just get started. We we got time, so let's go. let's pray. Avinu Shabbat Shalom, my heavenly Father. We are truly grateful for this time that we have in your Word, in this study. I ask Lord that your Spirit would guide us uh, as we look into your Word. That truth would be revealed. That it would be an engaging time. That this uh, revelation or this transformation that you introduced to us this evening and in this time would be beneficial for us, that it would bring uh, life and light and uh, an understanding of your great love uh, for us, Lord. So we turn this time over to you. We ask that you would just bless it. And uh, for those that are still coming, Lord, I ask that you would deliver them here safely in the name of Yeshua. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So at the end of last class, we were um, we had read the beginning. We'd finished through chapter 8, and we had begun a little bit of chapter 9 and stopped right before the, the um, rainbow covenant, uh, or we were talking about the rainbow. And uh, we were discussing, let's see, um, the whole idea of we had this nice little chart or two columns creation and recreation we compared genesis 1 with uh, genesis chapter 8 and how the lord was basically mirroring all of the creation events in the uh, subsiding of the, the flood and noah and sending out the birds and so how they all kind of paralleled one another we saw a complete uh, parallel that was matched up uh, through the six days. And that was exciting because um, we're realizing that the Lord isn't just taking, he's, he's re, he was not giving up on his creation, in other words. He wasn't saying, okay, this is enough. I'm done with it. Uh, we're going to cut it off and um, completely start anew. Rather, he said that um, Noah found hen, right? He found grace in the sight of God. And uh, Noah walked with him. He was righteous before the Lord, walked with the Lord. And therefore, the whole household was saved, which was exciting. And uh, we know that from the, the whole idea that violence was filling the earth, that it wasn't just the violence that men were committing one to another, but it was violence would uh, penetrate uh, the earth, as we would say, because the Lord said he had to destroy the earth and all of uh, flesh, but he preserved the earth and cleansed or or washed uh, the the earth clean, right? So we're getting this whole new start, which is pretty exciting. And then we were starting to make like a little list of things that we saw as being different um, in this new existence. And uh, one thing I did kind of try want us to point out is the as we looked at the creation and the recreation. There was a phrase, it was um, in verse 15 of chapter 8, where it said, in the 601st year, such and such happened. Let me, let me find it so I can read it exactly. Um, verse 15. No, 13. Um, now it came about in the 601st year, in the first month, on the first day of the month, the water was dried up from the earth. Now we know if we were taking that from creation, just thinking back to the genealogy of uh, Adam and Lamech and all that, there were much more than 600 years that had taken place. So that didn't make very much sense. What's the 601st year? Well, it was the 601st year of Noah. However, it was left out of the discussion prior to the flood. It was Noah was 600 when they entered into the, um, to the ark. And then when they're coming out of the ark, it was the 601st year, and it doesn't say of Noah. Now, we know we can make that connection, but we've discussed this a number of times that the Lord doesn't just leave something out of Scripture because he forgot or, you know, he didn't. He's very deliberate in what he's presenting. So there must be this concept that there is a new beginning, and it's this, of the 600th year, of course, we're thinking Noah which would be man. Another um, observation of this cre creation, recreation, 
keep pointing over here because that's where it used to be. It's not there anymore. <laughs> um, <clears throat> creation and recreation was the fact that the Lord had shut the door of the ark. And they, when everybody had come in, the animals and, and Noah and his family had come into the ark, uh, the Lord was the one that sealed them in. And then they were through the province of the Lord place where they were and, and recreation, uh, uh, the flood subsided, excuse me. And what happens? Noah opens the ark. So it's like this new beginning, right? And we find out all of these other new things that start to happen. I'm just going to read that to remind us. To, it'll actually help us as we go through the, these next sections. Um, uh, when they came out, and I'm going to start in chapter 8. <clears throat> Um, chapter 8, verse 16. Go out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons, and your sons' wives with you. Bring out with you every living thing of all the flesh that is with you, birds and animals and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, the fruit um, creeps and that creeps on the earth, that they may breed abundantly on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So Noah went out. And his sons and his wives and his sons' wives with him. Every beast, every creeping thing, every bird, every living thing that moves on the earth, they went out uh, by their families from the ark. Now Noah built an altar to the Lord, and he took every clean animal and every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. So that was a something new, right? So Noah opens the ark. He takes of these clean animals. We don't necessarily know what clean animals are at this point, like, definition. Uh, we may know later on in scripture, it gives us the detail, but at this point we don't necessarily know, but we know that there are different types of animals that are going to be offered as an offering. That word hola, and it's on a mizbeach, which is an, uh, an altar. So we know that this is a place of sacrifice, is what it's called, an altar. So he offers a sacrifice on an altar, an ola, which is a burnt offering, which ola means to go up. So it's this offering that's completely burned up. We'll discover later on that this is associated with the sin offering, the complete burnt offering, and it goes up to the Lord. And, of course, the Lord uh, says he smelled the soothing aroma, and the Lord said to himself, I will never again. He's, so this, this mizbeach uh, and this ola. Now, we, we looked back and noticed, well, what about Cain and Abel? Abel is the question. Didn't they offer uh, a sacrifice to the Lord? Rather, they actually brought, uh, um, where did they bring? Oh, a mincha. <clears throat> they brought a gift or a tribute to the Lord. They brought a gift to the Lord, and uh, we actually see that later on in Scripture. But it was not a sacrifice, and it was not on an altar. So things are shifting. Yes, there was something in a gift and a tribute out of one's heart, out of what uh, the Lord had already um, given to them. They're giving back. Here, there's something different in that. So these are the things that um, we may not get all the answers for as we're looking to them right now. But these are things that we should note as that they are different in the world in which we're now experiencing in this recreation. We're entering into chapter 8 and 9, and then we're going to discover more about those uh, as we move along. I feel like there's a question. Any questions? Are we good? Yes? No? I don't think I have a question. So, the orphan that was offered up, the burnt orphan that was offered up on the altar, God is the one that puts it in Noah's heart to do that because they've never done it before. They've never done that before, right? As far as we understand. So, um, and and this is interesting too because we well we don't I hadn't read it yet, but we know it from later on. We've already read it last week. Um, here, the Lord, when the mincha, the tribute was brought by Cain and Abel, the Lord took that right. And he partook of it. In that time, from what we understand, man only ate, you know, vegetation. Animal ate vegetation. The Lord was able to accept what? Animal and vegetation. Now, and that was pre-flood. This is God's ruling, right? He said um, uh, the, when he put them out of the garden, this is still God's kind of world. He was the one when Cain 
did the wrong thing. He pronounced judgment on Cain and cursed Cain. He said, now the ground, because you killed your brother Abel, there's not, you're not going to be able to receive the fruit of the ground. It's going to be cursed from the face of the ground, from, the, from my face. So the Lord is acting in a way that he's the one that's in dominion over this, this pre-flood creation. And he says, what my spirit will not strive with man anymore. And that comes from the word deen. Um, don, uh, deen, which is to judge. Don, don. He judges. Um, Dan means judge. So he, he judges. My spirit is not going to be the one that judges man anymore because violence is consuming the, the world. And, and, you know, this is when he says the son of um, God, uh, the sons of God came down and saw the, that uh, the sons of man were beautiful and all that kind of stuff, married them. That was, he, he said, this is it. You know, I see the end of man. It's violence is consuming, all that kind of stuff because I'm done with my spirit is not going to be the one that's going to do this kind of judgment that's going to happen. And so when we entered into this new world, we're seeing now something different. Man offers up a sacrifice that's burning. We said this, sooth this soothing aroma, right? And that almost gives us the mind of, okay, we can picture what that might be. You've been to a barbecue, right? You kind of have that smell when you smell something cooking. It smelled pretty good. I probably smelled pretty good at the temple or wherever because there was um, meat being cooked, meat being burned, that kind of thing. So um, here, the Lord, this means that he accepted it. It was a soothing aroma that he accepted the sacrifice. So there is a, there's something that is happening now. Now, we would ask ourselves, is he offering a sacrifice out of the knowledge or the need to go ahead and atone for something? There's no indication that that would be the case at this point. It would rather be perhaps some kind of thankfulness. Maybe he's thankful he brought him through this um, flood, right? And uh, somehow he's acknowledging that. But right at this case, we kind of just see that there was an altar, which uh, means, um, means a place of sacrifice, a place of this cutting, a sacrifice. And so he puts the olah, or a sacrifice, a burnt offering on the place of sacrifice. So we now have shifted from gift to sacrifice. Right, because I, I was thinking about either way, um, Cain and Abel, and now there was no instruction given to them that they need to do this. Right, as of now, right? Nothing at all. Um, <clears throat> So now uh, the Lord goes into and says, all right, I will never again curse the ground on account of man. And um, because I know the intent of, of man's heart is evil from his youth. I'm going to come back to that here at the end. Um, continuing uh, youth. And I will never again destroy every living thing as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night. Uh, shall not cease. Chapter 9, verse 1, And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. The fear of you and the terror of you will be on every beast and on every bird of the sky and everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea in your hand that they are given. Every moving thing that is alive shall be food for you. I give it to you as I have given you every plant. So <clears throat> now what would seem like what happened with God, right? God was able to partake or accept the minhag, that gift, that tribute that Cain and Abel gave. He accepted the firstlings of the, the sheep, right, of the, of the herd, and he accepted the grain, but they, so he could partake of both of those. Now what seems to be happening, he says, I'm giving you everything to eat, all of the animals and the vegetation. So that's kind of weird, right? Thinking about this now, just picture this. Now it seemed that God was in the diminutive. He was in charge of this. Now the recreated world seems to be behaving a little different. Man is taking a more of a front row involvement, more important almost, maybe, or just a more responsible, or he's being placed in a different position, right, in some, some way. I, we're not going to beat the garden. Because that was all in, in perfect harmony, right? We weren't 
killing animals. We weren't, we were in harmony with uh, man and woman, each and each, husband and wife. We were in harmony with God. Everything was in the perfect harmony. Now things started to shift and problems had to happen where then the Lord had to judge man or he had to be the one to mediate and, and make sure everything was running in a particular manner. And that wasn't going somehow, somehow that, that uh, existence came to a swift end because of the increase of the violence and uh, the, the influence of the, tr- ne- the tree of knowledge of good and evil, right? Immediately that went to a point of um, just the next generation, Cain and Abel, which led to murder and death, which is the complete and utter opposite of creation and life that God had um, began from the beginning, right? So it took, it took so short of a period of time for that to happen. Now, we can speculate, and I'll, I'll, I'll throw some of this out there. Why was that uh, pre-flood um, period so short in its existence relative to what we now, looking back, can say, okay, Noah was thousands of years ago, right? And how they're still around. How come we haven't reached this sometime end? Well, we're going to know there's this covenant and, and more covenants that come. But why do you think that was so short from the, the very beginning, that, 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 that existence? Any thoughts? If God was in control, wouldn't you think it would be like, you know, could go on forever kind of thing? What, what do you think? Any thoughts? Okay. okay. So <clears throat> what I would suggest is that You know, we're going to find out in later books, Leviticus and the like, that uh, the Lord's presence can't abide in the presence of sin and death or in in evil because he is so holy, right? He said, I'm not going to strive with them anymore because my, you, just a little bit, just a little bit of contamination, unholiness, evil, sin is can't be in his presence. That's how perfect he is. So through his grace and mercy, he came and dwelt with man. But just a little bit is so vastly different than him. And if he was to be completely, you know, he is completely righteous, but if he was going to be completely righteous, that is without the fact that he's going to be merciful and gracious in, in the sense that we would think, okay, a completely righteous and holy um, God would then go ahead and, and burn you up, right? Because you, that's the way it's supposed to be. Well, that's not how God is, and he demonstrates his forbearance and love within that, that period, and of course what's coming up with the, um, uh, the post-flood thing. But for him to go ahead and mediate true, uh, or mitigate, mitigate? When you dis- dispense it, what's the... Well, anyway, when you're going ahead and giving out the, the true, this, yeah, it's not the one I want, but it's okay. You get what I'm trying to get at. Uh, the, the fact that um, if he was to then be that judge very active in, in the exact things, we, the, the, the severity of the situation would escalate very quickly. God shows his grace and mercy to Cain, um, but, and then, he would just have to start to intervene so, so much. So I think without um, a righteous, and, and I hate to say this right now because you're not knowing what I'm thinking, without the, the, um, the actual uh, completion of what needs to happen to satisfy, and that's not the right word, to, to, to well, atone... That's kind of where I'm headed to to protect or to uh, satisfy uh, the what's happening with death, uh, which is happening with sin. Sin produces death, and so the Lord to be righteous, He has to show that that death is death. He can't just say death isn't death. You could, you're okay with what you're doing. You can keep going down that path. You know, he can extend grace and grace. I mean, Paul puts it the right way. Shall I sin that grace might abound? No, and that's what I believe the, the, the truncation of the pre-flood really is, is that 
the grace of God would have to abound and abound and abound, and we would never have ever wanted to to return to the Lord because we would be living in right. And and it's not that it needs to be consequences that will somehow bring us back, but there needs to be an understanding of what sin is. Paul again says, "How would I know what sin?" What covenant was if I wasn't told what, what coveting was, that kind of thing. So they're living in a world where there would be no rec- understanding and really knowing. There's the, when, when they ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and I'm glad we're talking about this, when, when they ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, uh, there was a yada, a knowing of evil in the sense that it was, it was not just a head sense or a knowledge of it, as I, I, I think I know what it means, right? It is an experience of it. And so they experienced it, and that has changed everything. It has changed everything of who we are. And we touched on it, um, and I'm going to come back to it. Uh, we touched on it at the end of class last week and uh, with the word yetzer. And I'm going to come back to that because I want to talk about it a little more in depth at the beginning of this class. It is going to be important. Yet, see, the form he knows that the intent of. Man-